Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to the Founders Day Symposium so in celebration of the 303rd birthday of Benjamin Franklin. It's my distinct privilege to offer opening remarks on behalf of Penn's Faculty Senate and to introduce our panelists and moderator. This is the fourth in a renewed tradition of celebrating Founders Day with a symposium that draws on Penn's distinguished faculty to discuss issues of global importance. This year's topic, Seeking Sustainability, Penn Confronts the Local and Global Challenge, is a timely one as the country enters a new phase in which there's likely to be increased emphasis on sustainability, green jobs, and clean energy. <clears throat> I'm sure you're all aware that the university is a leader in many ways on issues of sustainability with a very active um, Environmental Sustainability Advisory Committee, the T.C. Chan Energy Research Group in the School of Design, and increasing purchases of wind power to name just a few things. And we've made every effort to make this symposium as green as possible as well. The posters were printed on recycled paper. <laughs> the food is provided by a caterer who uses sustainable resources. And everybody's drinking water out of glasses instead of plastic bottles. Um, this symposium was organized by Senate past chair Larry Gladney, along with professors Marshall Lester and Eric Orts. Uh, Marshall Lester is ill and could not be here today. She sends her regrets. But I'm sure you'll agree that they've done an outstanding job of putting this symposium together. Each of our panelists brings a unique perspective to this discussion. You have detailed information about them in your program, so I just want to say a couple of things about each one that are relevant to the symposium. Dr. Gary Bernstein, yo, wave, is the Reese W. Flower Professor of Astronomy and Astrophysics in Arts and Sciences. He's co-creator of a very popular physics course, Energy, Oil, and Global Warming. Dr. Robert Giegengat, the Davidson Kennedy Professor Emeritus of Earth Environmental Science in SAS, is a geologist who spent 50 years studying the history of climate change, and he's the faculty director of the Master of Environmental Studies program. Dr. William Bram is Associate Professor of Architecture and Director of the Certificate Program in Ecological Architecture. He teaches <coughs> graduate courses in ecology, technology, and design, and has contributed to the Sustainability Plan and the Carbon Footprint at the T.C. Chan Center. Dr. Judy Birch is the Lawrence C. Nussdorf Professor of Urban Research, co-director of the Penn Institute for Urban Research and recently published a book entitled Growing Greener Cities. <laughs> <laughs> and Eric Ortz is the Guardsmark Professor of Legal Studies and Business Ethics and Management at Wharton where he teaches environmental <clears throat> law and policy and he's director of the initiative for global environmental leadership. Finally, I'm delighted to introduce the moderator of this discussion, President Amy Gutman who has shown extraordinary commitment to sustainable development. She signed the President's Climate Commitment in 2007, which committed the university to developing an institutional action plan for becoming climate neutral, and is a major force behind all the sustainability efforts on campus. Please welcome President Gutman. And thank you all for <laughs> Thank you, Sherry. Um, it is really a delight to be here on this brisk day in a warm auditorium, not overheated, uh, I hope. Um, we're heating it with our body warmth. And it's particularly wonderful to see a range of students and faculty and staff here because one of the signature strengths of Penn is that we are united in our commitment to this topic. And I begin by thanking Larry Gladney. Larry, where are you? Larry, uh, Marshall Lester, and Eric Ortz for putting this symposium together. It is wonderful to have a faculty senate that really cares about important issues. And there's no issue that's more important than this topic. 
Seeking sustainability, I believe, is an inspired choice for Founders Day. The American environmental movement was born in Philadelphia in 1739 when, who else but our founder, <laughs> Benjamin Franklin, led the push for improving local sanitation, conserving more open space and natural resources, and ending the dumping of tannery wastes into rivers and streams. We are the beneficiaries of that legacy, but today we face incredible challenges. And we face many challenges today. I need not remind you that we face a worldwide global economic challenge. But none, none requires more sustained and concerted efforts over the ne next several decades than the challenge of environmental sustainability. Just as the economic crisis I submit to you is too serious for economists alone to solve, so too the environmental crisis is too complex and serious for environmentalists alone to solve. And that's why we have an incredible array of academic experts here to help us understand and maybe even help us solve yep. this crisis. Um, not too tall in order, right, for my <laughs> colleagues here on the couch. Uh, let me just say a few words by way of, very few words by way of introducing this topic. And then I'm going to sit down and I'm going to moderate a discussion among our faculty experts. And then I'm going to open up the discussion to all of you. So while you're listening to us discuss, think of comments and questions, short comments, not lectures, but comments and questions you want to address to our panelists. So in his latest book, which I finished reading over the break, um, it's entitled Hot, Flat, and Crowded. Tom Friedman argues that a green <coughs> revolution is needed in America, a revolution centered on three pillars of sustainability, of energy efficiency, and of conservation. And he claims that this green revolution holds the key not only to the future of the planet, but also to our economic prosperity moving forward. In other words, if we don't engage the issue of sustainability, of environmental sustainability, we, and the we here is the we in this country, not only in the world at large, but in this country, we will not solve the economic, the fundamental problems at the root of our economic crisis. So I ask, is environmental sustainability of this revolutionary magnitude possible? We come together as a community of scholars to answer this question. So I'm going to sit down and begin not with the big global question, but with a series of questions that we need to answer if we're going to get to an answer to the big global question, which is, is it possible for us as a human race that has a frontal lobe distinct among all mammals, a frontal lobe that is capable of thinking forward and imagining our future, which we're going to have to do, is it possible for us to truly tackle this question? So thank you all for being here. And the seminar begins. <laughs> Okay, so first things first, and I'm going to start with, with Bob. Um, <laughs> hold on, hold on. You're not really surprised. What is sustainability? Well, thank you. <laughs> For That's the a very basic question, yes, It's a good right? question. For the last two fall semesters, I've participated in a class that was offered in our department. We chose to call it Toward Sustainability on Penn's Campus. And I co-taught it with Stan Leskowski and Dan Garofalo, who has not yet raised his hand. Dan? Dan is our sustainability Dan is our sus Dan sustainability We should recognize you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and as in every other course I've ever tried to preside over at the University of Pennsylvania, we started off the first day defining the terms we were going to use. And we spent many hours discussing what do we mean by sustainability. And we finally came back to the widely accepted definition 
which goes back to a 1987 publication by the United Nations called Our Common Future. The lead author was Gro Harlem Brundtland, a Norwegian physician who was Prime Minister of Norway and head of the World Health Organization. And she's a lead author of the report. And her definition of not sustainability, but sustainability, sustainable development, I will read to you to make sure I get it right. Sustainable development is development that, quote, meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And like so many definitions, this is a cop-out. <laughs> because it defines sustainability in terms of another term she did not define, which is needs. Mm -hmm. And we might say that the needs of a 21st century University of Pennsylvania student and the needs of a 21st century subsistence farmer in the Sudan are the same. But the perceived needs of a 21st century University of Pennsylvania student and a 21st century subsistence farmer in the Sudan are very different. And the, present, the, the definitions of sustainability which we now use so comfortably and so glibly do not anywhere define what represents our needs. And I submit to you, and we'll develop, of course, in our discussions, that we in the United States, we in Western Europe, we in the so-called developed countries are living far beyond our needs. And that's one of the questions we have to address as we approach sustainability. Thanks, Bob. That actually is, a, I think, a great way to begin because it suggests, I believe rightly, that there is no definition of sustainability that can be separated from how we define our needs as uh, species and as societies. I mean, we don't define our needs species-wide. They're you know, society by society and within societies different. So I think you've raised a very important issue. And I'm going to ask the next question to Eric here, which is, um, and this may be the most obvious question in the world to everyone here. But it's not obvious to everyone outside this room. And that is, why is sustainability important? Well, I, I guess I would, uh, on the assumption that we can define it uh, in some <laughs> general way, why, why, why it's important. And the way I would think about it is that um, humanity is becoming such a large force in the, on the planet. It's difficult for many people to appreciate this you know, because you need to a macro understanding of, of, of those kinds of effects uh, that are occurring. Uh, but it's dependent, the, the sustainable sustainability in the sense of everyone being able to live, uh, not only involving needs, but the desires that people, uh, that people uh, create or, uh, or are encouraged to think about, uh, have a very large impact on the material basis of uh, human society. And that relationship is important to understand because there seem to be a number of areas where the human species is, over, is overloading the material basis of its own existence. And we know in uh, biology that this is possible for species that don't think about it first. Uh, uh, we also know uh, in, in, with, with, with some increasing specificity that other societies in, on, in, in, in history have overshot their uh, material basis. Uh, there's a, a field of environmental history that's really uh, uh, examined a lot of this. Uh, one, one book to recommend there would be uh, Jared Diamond's Collapse, in which he uh, uh, explains a number of these cases. And what's very critical today is that the current society, the scale of that society, it's not like we, we, we might not get an extra chance if we overshoot in particular mm -hmm. ways. And then you can look at a, a number of problems, not only climate change, uh, but global uh, biodiversity loss. Uh, you look at freshwater situation. You look at the oceans are now dying. There was just a, a very uh, interesting uh, uh, survey uh, article in The Economist on that topic. So you go down the list, uh, ozone layer depletion. You go down this list and you realize that this is a very serious problem that we have to start to manage. And it's not an easy problem to manage because it's at, uh, uh, especially in the, in, the, in the case I mentioned, at a global level. And you know, the human species has not been very good <coughs> at managing global level kinds of problems. So I would say that's, the, that's my short answer for why it's important to consider these so issues. So if I um, make your short answer even shorter, um, 
you see it as a long-term threat to the survival of the ecosystem that we've been dependent on. So I guess my question um, to really uh, zero in on why we're here today um, is that's a, we're not very good at dealing with long-term problems as a society and as a species. So if it's important in a long-term kind of way, um, is there any good reason for short-sighted people uh, to be dealing with it when uh, most short-sighted people are worried about um, the stock market going up tomorrow or getting a job or um, you know, making sure they pass their next exam. Uh, uh, so is there, and I, I'm not going to put you on the spot, I'll put anybody on the spot here. Is there any way of um, making this uh, seem politically important? Jenny? I think it takes leadership. I think it takes leadership um, in the uh, various units in which we live. Uh, if we live in a university, we need the leadership of a president. If we live in a city, which we all do, we need the leadership of a mayor. If we live in a country, which we do, we need the leadership of a president. And it takes that leadership to rally our forces. It takes research around questions of why is it important, what's it worth to us. I think the economic questions are very important in, in thinking about this. And there's a moral side to this. And so I think there are many, many di dimensions, but it, is, it comes from leadership. Yeah. So if it comes from leadership, I look at you, and you're, you're all faculty leaders on this topic. And I'm curious, and I think a lot of people here would be curious as to how you got interested in this issue. Because all of you are in fields where you could have easily chosen not to be interested in the issue of sustainability, and you would have had perfectly eminent careers without you know, urban whether it's urban design or earth sciences or physics or certainly, you know, Wharton, it's not a natural to be focusing as you are on sustainability. So, Bill, why, why, are you, why did you get interested in it? I'm going to ask everybody yeah. because I think it's really interesting to figure out, and I hope you all ask yourself this question because I think it's in part a helpful answer to, even though this is a long-term problem, why are so many people now interested in it, despite the fact that we are, have a very short-sighted society in recent years? Well, in fairness, I knew the question was coming, but it has made me think about what it is. Yeah. Uh, and the simple answer is, I was in architecture engineering school in the late 1970s, sitting on gas lines at a moment at Princeton when uh, a quite a, an interesting group of people came together to think about solar heating of buildings. At the same time, another group uh, much more broad reaching came together to think about the total energy and resource challenges of that particular moment. So it was a, a remarkable moment. It looked like the, the only direction for a smart young architect to go. And five years later, it looked like nobody in the world was interested in it. <laughs> but as I thought about it, and in fact, why we describe our own uh, small certificate program at this point as ecological, I grew up in a small town in western Pennsylvania still close to the farming communities that were its origin. And though my grandfather was a judge and had a judge's house, the back was a really massive garden. They supplied their own house with uh, food. And without anybody making an issue out of it, recycled, uh, composted things, closed virtually all of the loops. And I, I actually see it quite evidently in the difference between that existence and mine, the degree to which that, I would call it farmer's logic, is one which we, in a way, have to regain as metropolitan, uh, as a growing metropolitan culture, and find ways to do those same things. So you're bringing farming to the city, so to speak. Exactly. Right? We're all farmers. Right. Yeah. <laughs> We're all farmers now. That's good. <laughs> Gary? Well, my situation is a little different from everyone else here. Uh, so I study cosmology, probably the only subject in the university where the obliteration of Earth's atmosphere would be considered an insignificant event. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, have to, it's not my research interest. You really take the long-term cost of <laughs> I think that's right? part of the thing, right? Uh, one thing you realize when you study astronomy is that there's 
no law of nature that says that the earth has to remain comfortable right. and stable for humans. So if it begins in a black hole, where does it end? <laughs> That's a whole other symposium okay. I think we can get into. Go ahead. Uh, so why but, sustainability? Well, to me, then I, well, you realize when you see the way things work on the really long term is that we've been quite lucky. We've had a pretty good 10,000 year run of climate here. And there's nobody taking care of that for us. It's, uh, it's ours to mess up. Mm -hmm. uh, so my involvement, as I said, is not in my research, but in teaching. And I was uh, motivated to start teaching about energy and oil just by seeing what I considered a lot of uneducated behavior on the part of people in journalism and politics and policy making. And I felt that the Penn students should know better than that if they're going to make any intelligent decisions that help us plan for events that we know are likely or inevitable. Hmm. So if you think that the Prius gets better mileage because it gets its energy from electricity, you have to come and take my class and we'll <laughs> set you straight. <laughs> Basics. Bob. Well, as, as long as I can remember, I've, I've been interested in the conservation of natural resources, but initially emotionally and aesthetically because I liked w wild places and wild things. And I didn't start to think about sustainability until as a professional geologist, I've done a lot of field work, and I have lived in communities which have come as close as any on Earth today to sustainability. I've lived in isolated villages, in oases in the Sahara, where there was no input, there was no output, and everything depended on what those people could raise for themselves. I've lived in villages, farming villages in the Nile Valley and high in the Andes, where there's almost no input or output to the system beyond what these people do. And I've also lived and functioned in some of the least sustainable communities on Earth, helicopter-supported tent camps in Antarctic valleys or offshore drill rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. And this has taught me things about how we might move towards sustainability, but I want to leave you with one important thing. The, the sustainable communities I've lived in, you would not enjoy. <laughs> the, the birth rate is very high. The uh, neonatal mortality is very high. Adult life expectancy is very low. Endo and ectoparasites are ubiquitous. Right? The, this is not a place any one of us would choose to live Especially Why the do you women call that amongst sustainable? Us. It's sustainable because we're going on for generations and generations. Well, it's sustained life, but, is that's, but have it, they met the needs question. of the people? They think so. They're not living and long? Th th this is the original community in which the women are barefoot and pregnant. And that's what... <laughs> but I'm not sure I agree Jean, that's sustainable. But Bob, what Jeannie is <laughs> suggesting is that's too narrow a notion I understand. Of I did, but I, I've been casting around in my mind, where have I seen sustainability? Persistent, long-term, generation-to-generation sustainability, and it has been in these primitive circumstances. I'm not saying that's good. I'm not saying that's bad. You're but they, you asked me how I got into this. Yeah. And no, I, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Guilty as charged. <laughs> so I'm interested in that comparison. It is a very important um, comparison for us to make because if the trade-off is between uh, basically becoming undeveloped mm -hmm. and therefore lowering life expectancy and so on, as Jeannie suggests, that's not, not only won't we choose it, but there are good arguments no. for not choosing that because it's got to be sustainability consistent, as right. you said, with some reasonable understanding right. of what human needs are. Yes, and certainly, for example, in the societies you're talking about, the infant mortality, the life expectancy of women is terrible, terrible. Com you know, compared to more right. developed societies. But just one more. No. Go ahead. Novocaine is not sustainable. Do you want and to elaborate <laughs> on this? <laughs> Where is that coming from? And, and, and many of us are very dependent on Novocaine. So the, 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 com the combined knowledge, the infrastructure that gives us the lifestyle that we enjoy today, it's very dif difficult yes. to justify that as a sustainable system. Yeah. I think there are yeah. ways to get there, but it's not instantly obvious how we do that. We cannot easily share the lifestyle of the American West in the 21st century right. with what will be 11 billion people worldwide in 60 years. Right. 
But it also has to be pointed out, yeah. this undesirable lifestyle is not something you would plan for, but it may be something you'll end up with if you make no plan. Yes. Right. That's, that's a very, very good That's a very good point. <laughs> right. um, the point is, of this whole seminar, and for everything that I hope comes out of it, is it's not obvious how we can move forward. Um, it is obvious how we can fail. Um, basically, do the same things we've been doing for decades now, and Gary's scenario is going to come about sooner rather than, than later. So I, I just want to ask um, Jeannie how, how you got interested. In well, from this. many, many uh, directions. First, from the training that I have, city planning, and by its definition, is interested in very important questions about what are optimal size cities and where should people live and how should they live and what needs should we meet, including life expectancy. Um, <laughs> my own experiences, yes. um, I lived in Latin America in, a few years ago and saw the slum development there and, and that was certainly not sustainable and, and these questions of urbanization and how you can make uh, urbanization occur in a sustainable way uh, influenced my thinking. And of course being here in Philadelphia, a green country town, <laughs> Uh, a town that has a beautiful park system that has framed its development, uh, the uh, traditions that we have here of, uh, in, at Penn, uh, Ian McCarg's tradition that he, he brought to us in our own school, um, are all things that have influenced my um, belief and my uh, excitement about yeah. today's current um, interest in sustainability. And it should be said that the School of Design at Penn has really been a leader on this topic, and Jeannie, um, Institute, the Penn Institute of Urban Research, is really taking a strong and important interest in it, as is the, the center that Eric leads. And Eric, how did you get interested in the topic? Well, I, I, uh, I think I share a, a, a background of some other commentators here of an early experience of the importance of the environment. In my own case, uh, my father was a veterinarian in a small town, also had a, had a farm out back. <laughs> And I think that that's important, and uh, uh, maybe we can, uh, anticipating some other questions you might be asking in terms of uh, how other people get involved. I think it's surprising that, but 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 uh, to me at least, but it's but not when you think about how many people grow up. That it's very easy to grow up today in an advanced civilized society and not have that experience. You know, not not be connected to where the food comes from and not not really appreciate the. Uh, the environmental basis of civilization. Uh, and one other experience slightly uh, later was actually going out, as, as Geek says, in the wild and experiencing that. By the I way, think, Bob I think is the, also known as Geek. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, Bob. <laughs> uh, but, but the experience of going into wilderness, and, and, and I think that in those, that's, in some ways that's the, the best, and perhaps in, for some topics, the only way to experience the, the, the human uh, the, the human condition and, and how, how much we are dependent on these larger natural forces. So I, 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 that started, and then professionally, um, uh, so one takeaway on that for how we might as a university try to encourage this among students mm -hmm. is maybe make available experiences. Like uh, I, just, I, I just came back from the Wharton Leadership Venture in Antarctica, and some people were, had never been actually in a, that extreme an environment. And it was quite transformative for those students who had the opportunity to go. So and that you might be something. Back. You yeah, brought exactly. the well, climate back right here <laughs> yeah. to yeah. Philadelphia. Yeah. 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 Thanks a lot. Yeah. 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 Actually, Thanks a lot. slightly <laughs> warmer in Antarctica than it is today. <laughs> um, but the, um, the more uh, professionally, uh, the switch, I was originally, and still am to some extent, a corporate law, securities law person. Mm -hmm. And there were some, I was encouraged to uh, think about this, and there were some suggestions for how companies make decisions, to what extent should companies be able to consider sustainable issues, et cetera. But how I really got into it was a colleague who was the director of a center, had research funds available, and I expressed some interest in going to the Earth Summit in 1992 in Rio. Uh, this was a period where I think a lot of the business community was starting to shift and say, you know what, we have to get involved because the governments are of the world are really not going to get involved. So you started to have a shift. And this colleague basically said, well, come and talk to me, and then said, well, okay, you're, you're approved. It was the, the least bureaucracy I ever went <laughs> through to do that. And I guess the takeaway for that is how can we... How can my initiative, and see John Keane, we haven't done this yet, John had the idea, he said, well, set up a research fund for, for, for young faculty or others to, uh, to apply for these kinds of things. So, so I think that that's, uh, 
that's how I professionally got interested was that was the availability of that uh, that, that, uh, that opportunity. So one very interesting fact uh, that has become just so vivid to me as president of Penn is how many young people um, who are not planning careers in sustainability or teaching it or doing scholarship are avidly interested in this. And there are many students here today, and I welcome you especially, because it will be in your hands as to whether anything we talk about today and we do at Penn is carried on in the future. And so I ask our panelists um, to begin with the teaching mission of the university. How do we teach sustainability? I mean, what is the most responsible, effective way for a university like Penn, indeed for Penn, um, given that we now are as an institution committed to being leaders <coughs> on this, how do we teach it? I, I mean, I have to say, I think it begins almost exactly with the kind of problematic opposition of cases that we've heard here. I have no idea if Novocaine is sustainable. Um, <laughs> because the, you, you've given a clue, but, yeah. but the term by which you suggested it might not be sustainable requires a whole quite broader set of, uh, of questions. Right. So I think the opening, the making the questions real, but also making it clear how challenging they are and the kinds of work you have to do in order to open them up. It, it then, of course, does change with disciplines. Architects, of course, tend to be interested in or need to be interested in the way in <coughs> which things work and operate, and so efficiency becomes certainly an important aspect. But I think equally, the ethical, moral questions that come along with these are completely bound up with it. So when, again, I'm using the example, when Geek yeah. suggests that Novocaine is not sustainable, but the living in a, in a um, minimal agricultural, even hunter-gatherer mm. society is somehow inherently sustainable, it immediately begs the question of, is there something in between advanced technological civilization and survivalism that, 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 that is wor worthwhile. Yeah. So I think then you, I can imagine each of these disciplines, and I think it does take the different disciplines, to ask in different ways, what would it take to find that, uh, that, that yeah. workable yeah. solution? So let's begin with the disciplines, and I look to Gary, because Gary also said something surprising about the Prius. I, I went to rent a car, <laughs> and you go into the, they tell you, any, take any car from aisles four or five. <laughs> they said at National Rent-A-Car, and there was a Prius, and I gravitated right to the Prius and went in, and then I didn't know how to turn it on, so I, <laughs> <laughs> I did the Chevy, I went to the Chevy. <laughs> <laughs> Chevy and now I, feel, I felt terribly guilty, Gary, until you told me that the Prius was the wrong choice. Oh, no, um, I didn't mean to Okay, so, but <laughs> seriously, um, it's not like Justice Potter Stewart said about pornography, I know it, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it, he said about pornography. Sustainability isn't like that, right? We don't know it when we see it. We really have to understand what's going on between what we choose to do, what products we use, what processes we engage in, what energy we consume. We have to really know something about what its effects are on the environment. That can be baffling, even a simple choice requires a lot of background study to find out what the quote yeah. right answer is. Now, wind power is good, right? <laughs> Tell me that, right? We, we assume Ann Papa George and I are, you know. Better be. <laughs> so, no, but tell, how do you teach it? How do you teach it? Because you do. Well, I, I guess I don't start with the word sustainability. I start with a list of problems that we have. So problems. Uh, and what are the big problems, at least in my course, that we focus on are global warming, carbon, and oil. Mm -hmm. And these are both things that we know in the long run we will have to deal with. Right? How long exactly, you can debate about, but you have to deal with them. So what I try to make sure of is that at, piece, at least people know what the problems are and have the basic scientific background to understand the solutions. That's only a technological thing. You know, uh, there are many other aspects to coming up with a solution that are societal, legal, financial. But at least I can do my part of giving the students that part of the background that they'll need. Good. So you're a physicist, and you're a great enough physicist to get tenure at Penn, but a lot of students who need and want to know this 
are not going to major in physics. Yeah. Is that a problem for you that you don't that the students who come to your course are not? Well, it's actually an opportunity. Okay, so tell uh, I mean, us something said, about that. As you said, this is something that a lot of students are interested in, <coughs> and I think if a course can fill a lecture hall in a physics building full of students who would normally stay as far away from a science course as possible, that tells you that there's something, both an opportunity for our department and a real interest, and it gives me a lot of hope that people <coughs> will take that knowledge and use it. <coughs> Whereas normally if they fulfill those science requirements, they might try to forget that as quickly as possible. Yeah. Well, it gives me a lot of hope as <laughs> yeah. president because I think it's very important that great scholars not only be willing but eager like you are to teach students who are not <coughs> go going to go into your field but are going to benefit tremendously by s from someone who can explain in ordinary language, pretty high-level concepts. Well, I think that it's a motivation that lets people understand things that they probably would have thought they couldn't do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's something that I really enjoy exploiting, right? Uh, so that people walk away and get that knowledge much better than they would. And it also brings me into other things as well that I wouldn't have learned much about unless I'd gone to the effort yeah. to prepare this course. So how else do we teach it? And should we be doing more than we're doing? I mean, there is no um, field called sustainability. And from what Gary said, it probably doesn't make sense to create a discipline called sustainability because it's inherently interdisciplinary. You have to know physics. You have to know geology. You have to know some economics. And my field is political science. You better understand some of the politics of this. Because it's not easy just to say to run for president, and nobody has run for president, even the pro environmentalists. And I'm going to raise a carbon tax. <laughs> I'm going to, you know, it's just not a winning position today. It might be with the right leader at the right time, but you need to know a lot of different disciplines. So, how can we, how do we, and how should we be teaching it? It's like any, I think it's like any of the important and critical issues in our times. We need to infuse it in everything that we do. And we don't need to have extra special courses all the time. Of course, we need some special courses, but I think it ought to be informing how and what we're teaching. Uh, I'm fortunate in my field because sustainability has always been part of its history. And, and the questions that it's dealt with have been questions of sustainability. They've not been expressed in those terms, however. So it's up to me to explain to the students, for example, that really these have been questions that we've been dealing with for many, many, many <laughs> decades and generations. And how have we dealt with them? So we have long lecture courses. We have regular seminar courses. And we're fortunate because we have studio courses in our, in our programs. And uh, John Barnett over there, who's sitting in the second row has just completed a course looking at a studio looking at climate change and what it might affect and how it might affect this region and he brought in not only our students but also the political decision makers as part of the juries and so we've got that kind of interchange between people who are thinking trying to think about these things but don't have the time that students and professors have to think about these things and had the interchange among them uh, which was a very valuable interchange, uh, both from the point of view of the students and from the point of view of the decision makers. Now, a lot of people have said, and this includes Al Gore, who won the Nobel Prize in this area, and former President Clinton and others, that the only way that sustainability is going to be possible is if it's economically efficient. So, Eric, what's Wharton doing? <laughs> to, to, to lead the way here. Yeah, everyone's picking up Wharton lately pressure. for some reason. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not sure if I can. I, I think uh, what what I what I would say is that there are. If you look at what are the drivers for why we have some of the problems that are on the agenda, then certainly the economics of various kinds of decisions are a large part of that. And so. Uh, just to pick up on one example you give about a carbon tax, probably, I, I would say I almost don't know of any uh, serious environmental policy person who would vote against that, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's, to, to, almost it, it, it cuts across all ideological grounds in terms of any scientific, rational, objective approach to uh, energy problems would suggest that you would tax 
certain problematic energies and uh, you would have energy sources and you would then increase the incentive, economic incentives mm -hmm. to develop others. And right now we're in a very difficult situation where that's not politically feasible and so it looks like we might be in a second best solution of can we, uh, can we create subsidies? And then there's a, but from an economic point of view, that raises a lot of questions. Well, how, how do you pick subs? How do you pick winners? It, it, there's mm -hmm. not a lot of very good track record, that sort of thing. There is a but middle I think ground, that, right, I think that, Eric? I think there is there a cap and trade possibility where if you set the cap at the right global level, which would be effectively at the same level of a carbon tax would allow, yeah. you could then allow trades, which is yeah. more palatable, but politically palatable, perhaps. But at least it is, if you, again, it depends on where you set the cap, it yeah. would allow trades. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. And I think that there have been a lot of economic policy discussions that affected where we are on cap and trade. And that we, we have a, uh, there's, it's a, it looks like it's a more efficient current system than some others. There's mm -hmm. a debate, which we won't get into, about whether just a flat tax on uh, greenhouse gases mm -hmm. would be more economically mm -hmm. efficient, but again, Taxes are a bad word for lots of people. They're not. Uh, they're not. Prob they're not politically likely, et cetera. But I think you know just the basic uh, reason why economics is important is that this is this is how these decisions uh, take place. So if you're going to talk about how are we going to reform the law in a way that takes advantage of that, if you're if you're not paying attention to the basic economics of the situation, then I don't think you're really going to get uh, to solutions. The 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 the, the business business practices and consumers will avoid those, <laughs> avoid dealing with those kinds right. of problems. And so uh, just to feed this into the more general discussion, I guess I would say that uh, it's important for people to have disciplines in terms of their education, for students to get a single discipline. Because if you don't have any single discipline that you understand, then it's not very helpful. And then at the same time, you need to be able to at least understand the economic side, the political side, the, the science if you're not a scientist. And I think that's the vision of sustainability that I see, or, or education about sustainability that I see Penn pursuing that is really very, that, that at least I'm, I'm a believer in that yeah. approach. And, and, and there, team I, teaching could examples. really be yeah. a, a big plus in this regard. By the way, I do think we shouldn't take off the table a carbon tax. After all, yes. Barack Obama did run on a position that he was going to raise taxes on a 5% of the population. Now, this a carbon tax would affect a lot more than that. But it goes back to what Jeannie said earlier. With the right leadership and making this an issue that really a wide range of people understood and cared about, and the fact that in the medium run, it would benefit our society tremendously by being energy independent. I think there is a possibility there. I would not rule it out. I would just say that one has to understand what the political obstacles are, and you have to think creatively about how to overcome them. I was going to yes. jump in on the interdisciplinary Bill. point, because I, on the one hand, I, I, I quite agree that having disciplinary strengths and, and from students' perspectives of learning to do things that they are inclined to do and learn to do better is fundamental. But I think the interdisciplinary nature of this is really uh, can't be overlooked. It's, uh, we often cite that the, the word economics and the word ecology come into use at roughly the same time, at about the time that people mm -hmm. are noticing in different contexts the connectivity between things, the ways in which dynamics affect them. I think if we're going back to the, the tough question of how do needs uh, make demands on resources, we also have to pay attention to the interesting, difficult social history of the way in which the luxuries of one generation become the needs of the next, and one doesn't simply roll those backwards. So, I think crossing boundaries, having people mm -hmm. teaching together, having students cross those boundaries, all of those are ways to get those problems to connect. So I have to tell a story and then I'm going to open it up for your questions and comments and I'm sure our faculty panelists will engage you um, as well as each other. And the story is that um, several months ago I and a group of Penn faculty members were in Dubai at the invitation of the World Jesus Economic ago, Forum for something called Global Agenda Councils, and they were on the big issues of our time, including sustainability and the economic crisis. And we all, there were 700 thought leaders from around the world, and we all came together at the end, um, and people got up, the heads of each 
Agenda Council to talk about what their takeaways were and to see if there were any similar takeaways from these large groups. And the most significant takeaway was the importance of integrating knowledge across disciplines and all these issues. I mean, it was the, what I summarized earlier in that the economic crisis is too serious for economists alone to solve and the environmental crisis similarly. And that's why I do um, believe more um, firmly than ever, even when we began the Penn Compact, that this kind of being, knowing a discipline, but also bringing disciplinary strengths together is very important for this issue.